Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. I know it's lunch hour, so I think people are probably going to be hungry. Um, so here we are. Uh, this is basically I'm going to be in conversation with uh, the amazing Isaac Julian, which is sitting right here next to me. And I think a lot of people know quite a lot about him already. So I think I'm just going to skip the introduction bit uh, and go, go right in. Um, but the reason, I think one of the reasons why Isaac is here in Hong Kong with us is because uh, we, M Plus, have curated an exhibition that's called Mobile M Plus Moving Images. And we are actually showing Isaac 10,000 Waves, a three screen version installation of the work at Cal Depot at the moment. So. Um, I think it might be good then we start with that work. Maybe you can sort of talk a little bit about that inspiration behind that. Why did you want to do something about, which is based on an actual real life incident that happened in 2004. So maybe you can sort of speak a little bit about that for us. Well, first of all, I, I want to um, thank Yama for um, including me in his exhibition and plus moving image and uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it but it's an amazing exhibition um, that's um, based um, in Midtown and also at the Village Art Depot. Yeah, Cal yeah. Depot Artist Village in Togwa One which is on the Kowloon side. You should definitely go and check it out. The neighborhood is amazing as well. And uh, in fact the neighborhood reminds me exactly of when I first came to Hong Kong um, which was in the mid 80s. And it was really that encounter of coming to Hong Kong in the mid 80s and sort of being exposed to um, sort of Hong Kong cinema and especially Wong Kai Wai and seeing the amazing Maggie Chong in those early works that I became really very interested in this area of moving image production. And at that time, when I first started making films, um, there are a number of us who felt that the avant-garde in terms of independent filmmaking had actually swung to this area with a lot of the Taiwanese new wave filmmaking that was happening at that particular moment as well. Um, and one of the things, of course, for me, which has been very important, is really that how does one begin to really think about um, questions of movement um, in the 21st century? And of course, that develops from the fact in my own life, um, my parents had moved from one part of the globe to the other, and that was in the search of a better life. And one of the things, of course, I guess I must be the product of that sort of movement. So when I came across um, the tragedy which occurred in 2004, when 23 Chinese cockershaw pickers died on the Lancashire coast at Morecambe Bay, because of the lack of knowledge of how the coastal tides worked, they were there really trying to, uh, in a way, achieve a better life. They were picking cockle shells, or doing all the things that they probably didn't really want to do, but had to do. And in that sort of um, moment, um, you know, they lost all their lives. And this was really very moving to me and very tragic, and it really underscored the real kind of danger and risk that people will go to achieve that better life. And so um, I was very struck by this. And also the connection to the actual question of the ocean, of waves, and how that signifies in um, sort of black cultures. You know, this also was something which was really signifying to me. And so for me, one of the things in making this work was to, in a way, I guess you could say there is a certain degree of mapping on sort of one's sort of experience onto this experience and then thinking how you can try to bring to light this kind of tragedy, but to try to do it in a different way from how news reporting would do it. Um, because of news reporting that I actually got to find out about this tragic event. And when I started making the work, 10,000 Ways, I went to the location of a poet, Wang Ping, um, who's um, from Shanghai originally, and she lives now in America. She's a fantastic poet. I brought her to the site of the tragedy in 2006, and a year later she gave me this poem which was called Small Boats. And, uh, each stanza of that poem is dedicated to 
a, a, pers a person that died. And with that poem then, I sat, I sat on a kind of, you could call it an expedition on my own sort of um, movement to China. And I started to research the project and I went to the Fujian province. Um, in a sense, one of the things that had happened, the BBC had made this quite interesting documentary about this tragedy. And also Nick Broomfield um, was also making a film um, which is titled Ghosts about the tragedy, um, which is going to be shown with the single screen version of um, 10,000 Ways, which is called Better Life on March 20th in the film program. Yeah, this Friday, actually. This Friday. And one of the things about what I wanted to do was to really try to look at this tragedy in terms of, I guess, a, a kind of allegory. What would be the allegory for this kind of journey? And it took us four years to come across the Mazu fables. When we came across the Mazu fables, we read several of them, there are hundreds of them, and it was a tale of Yishin Island, which in a way allegorized this tragedy for us. Um, Mazu brings the fishermen to uh, places of safety at the time of storms and turbulence in the seas to Yishin Island. And I saw the metaphor of Yishin Island as the space to bring back the lost souls back to, um, to Middle Earth. And so uh, with that, we began to build the whole sort of installation and structure <coughs> of the work. <coughs> and it was also with the help of m many people that I worked with, um, sort of Maggie Still, the producer, we had um, sort of many collaborators who worked with us in mainland China over the period of four years. And we were able to, I think, make a project where we were really working all together to try to make something also new because the work is a nine screen work in its original um, sort of version. And we wanted to make a work that would somehow also break the paradigm of many video artworks to try to do something new, something different. And so it was that in mind that we set off on our journey making the piece. Um, the piece premiered at Sydney and then went on to be shown in over 20 countries, including the Museum of Modern Art, who recently acquired it for its collection. Uh, I've got two questions based on what you were just saying. Uh, the first one would be, um, you mentioned black culture, which is something you actually saw you were really interested in in your earlier careers. I think you're still interested in that as well, but you were exploring a lot of that kind of ideas about race and gender, for example, I think. Uh, but also, I think, you know, you mentioned about uh, Chinese cinema as well, the history of Chinese cinema. And um, the fact is, in 10,000 Ways, you, 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 you invited Maggie Chong and Zhao Tao, who are sort of really famous Chinese actresses in that work as well. I mean, can you sort of elaborate a little bit more about that, the relationship between the black culture that you were saying to this work, but also the, um, the reason as to why you invited those actresses and, and how does that relate back to the Chinese sort of cinema history as well? <clears throat> well, I spoke about this question of the representation of the sea and Derek Walcott, who won the <coughs> Nobel Prize for Literature <clears throat> for his book, um, Omaros, um, wrote a book um, called The History, the sea is history. And um, this metaphor of the sea and what that represents in sort of um, black cultures, I think is an obvious one in relationship to slavery and voyaging and these sorts of metaphors. And so for me, I think one of the things in the Mazu fables was how would I be able to actually sort of um, connect to Chinese culture through the fable, but in a sense that could be really very, um, that could really generate a certain aura. And so I had the fantasy in mind that since I was such a Maggie Chong fan, wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to try to see if someone like <clears throat> Maggie Chong would play this role? And well, luckily for me, um, there are two people who I know who knew Maggie Chong fairly well. Um, 
a friend of mine called Ruby Rich, who is a film critic, who has um, written about cinema for many, many years, and um, has traveled many film festivals. In fact, I was here in Hong Kong with her on one of my early films showed in 1996, um, and she met Maggie Dan, and also Tilda Swinton, who I'd worked with on a film on Derek Jarman, and um, basically both of them spoke to Maggie, and when they spoke to Maggie, Maggie actually said, well, I know Isaac Julian's work. You know, I've seen some of his films, and I met up with her in London, and basically, you know, she read the treatment, she read the script, and she said, well, Isaac, actually, I don't do films anymore. I've retired from the cinema. And, but she said, I'm really very drawn to this character. I'm really drawn to Mazu. I think this tragedy was really terrible, and I'd love to be able to collaborate with you on this work and to play this role. And so um, that's how that happened, and it was quite amazing. Um, I was even astonished myself. And uh, her collaboration in the work was so important because in a sense, because of the kind of um, history that is embodied in Maggie Chong's persona, um, you know, she's made over 100 films and her position here um, in Hong Kong cinema, in a sense, she is a screen goddess and in a sense, she had to play Mazu who is you know, a kind of goddess of the sea. And so both these things twinned in that role. And indeed, when we first showed the work in Shanghai in 2010 at Shanghai Art, she came to the opening and, you know, literally all the workers, you know, went home and changed and got into their Sunday best, you know, because they were going to be, you know, meeting their icon, their star, and this really resonated with me in terms of, you know, the relationship to, in a way, reading the, the image of the, 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 the identification and the importance of, um, you know, having Chinese stars against, say, the kind of more traditional sort of mainstream Hollywood systems, etc. So that was really important to me, it really resonated with me, and I think it resonated in terms of how people related both to that work. And then in the case of Zhao Tao, I had seen her in many, many films. I see her as being a sort of, um, I mean, she's her own person, but if I was going to make an approximation, you know, I would say she's like, for me, the Chinese Tilda Swinton, in the sense that she is very committed to making art cinema films, and she doesn't compromise in terms of the roles that she plays. You know, she's a very serious actress, actor, and you know, I mean, I find her sort of, and when you cast, you're also thinking about how people will identify with the role. So for me, she also had a certain baggage, a certain persona that she could give to that role as the person who, is perhaps someone who either may have been in the Morgan Bay tragedy or may have had her husband or brother be in that tragedy, but someone who's haunted. And I think in many of her roles, she plays this kind of haunted sort of character. And, um, and so her performance was very important. So in a way, these collaborations are sort of very important. And uh, I mean, I couldn't really believe that I was able to get both those sort of actors um, to be in the piece and to do the things that they did. Yeah, yeah. but um, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, the character of Zhao Tao is a reference to a character that was in an old Chinese film, The Goddess. Is that the case? And why is that? Why would you be so, so interested in that character or that particular film? Well, The Goddess, which is a silent film um, from 1934, is a kind of classic of Chinese cinema. It's a film which um, basically looks at the journey of a woman who comes from the countryside to the city. You know, she comes from, you know, the countryside in um, to Shanghai, and for her to um, create a better life for herself, she resorts to prostitution, also to look after her child. 
and in a way there are many references in 10,000 Waves to Chinese cinema and this reference was really important because in the work we basically um, start off in sort of England then we get to come to China present day China then we go to 30s then we end up in the Ming period in the 15th century when we go back to Yishin Island and uh, so this transitional moment of the 30s of um, the goddess when the film was made was important for me to represent because in her character I saw her as time traveling back into time but I saw her also as the representation of when people were also trying to make a better life for themselves in the city in Shanghai and this is represented in this film and this film of course really resonates because also Maggie Chong played this role um, in the Stanley Kwan film um, that was made um, called Center Stage which I believe um, he won a prize at the Berlin Film Festival for in 1993 and so in a way this character who just signifies in a very particular way because the actress um, who played this role also was a very famous actress at the time and, and committed suicide soon after making that film and so it kind of resonated very strongly in um, sort of Chinese sort of um, cinema history and uh, recently this film has had a revival where the British Film Institute have um, restored the master along with um, the Beijing Film Archive so there's a lot of work and attention that's been focused back onto this film and I was merely just quoting from it in my work. So, yeah. That's great. Um, I think, um, let's just switch the gear a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this more technical aspect of the installation. Uh, in particular, the fact that, you know, with the nine screen version, you, you, it's quite deliberate that you wanted to encourage movement. I mean, it, I mean it's a completely immersive experience, no matter what, but I think you, you, you sort of wanted the way each time you present it, you wanted to encourage to, to movement from the audience, which sort of resonates with the, the movement or journey that you've been so talking about in this work. And I think when we started talking about the installation here as well, I think, uh, because the, um, the actual venue itself is a heritage site, so it presented quite a lot of challenges, I think, in terms of how we could install it. Um, basically, we couldn't touch the building at all, and we, <laughs> you know, we didn't really have a lot of time in terms of uh, getting the site ready for the actual installation as well. But I think that um, the, the, the notion of, of course, you know, besides on giving the audience a really immersive experience. I mean, the, the notion of movement's always been there as well. We sort of talked quite a bit about that and the fact that we decided to have the screens in the middle so that, and then it's double-sided so that, you know, audience can walk around the whole installation, you know. Um, can you sort of speak a little bit more about that and why you wanted that um, as part of the, the work in a way? I mean, one of the things around making this work was, um, of course, you know, I've been making film installation works for some time. And uh, of course, you know, you could ask the question, well, why make a film work in a sort of gallery context when you can go to a cinema to see it? I mean, it's much more comfortable. You can sit down, eat your popcorn, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the reasons for me, or why I was very excited about making works in the gallery or museum context was in a way, the opportunity that it gave for you to have a different experience in relationship to the moving image, in relationship to film, in relationship to video art, that usually when people go to a museum or gallery, they expect to see something different. And so I like the idea of being able to create an element of surprise in works. And the element of surprise in this work was to make a piece which was a nine screen work, which of course is kind of technically impossible, um, I would say a decade ago but it's possible now because of computerization and digitalization. And one of the things I've been working on is really how can the audience have a different relationship to the moving image. And when I had a show at the Pompidou in 2005, I worked with um, Christine Van Asch, who um, then was um, the creator for Moving Image, on an exhibition, it was called Phantom Creole. And what we did is that we made a four screen work 
to break away from the free screen works I was making. And we put all the cushions into the center or seats of the space. And basically, we were trying to sort of make the audience have a different relationship to looking at moving images. But what happened was that the audience got all the seats and moved them to the position where they could view all the four screens in totality. And so, in a way, kind of like, we learned from that, that basically our idea didn't work and that the audience wants to see everything at once because, you know, um, they want to enjoy all the images. So when I made um, 10,000 Waves, it was really the idea that you could view it from many, many perspectives in a kaleidoscopic way that would enable you to have relationship to the work. And this goes back to many ideas, early ideas in cinema around the idea of the mobile spectator, that basically when you're looking at images, that it's essentially kind of, you know, we go to the cinema to be entertained, but the idea of thinking or where there's the relationship to sort of art and um, making sort of visual connections, um, where does the work go into that? really only happens if you're able to try to seduce the audience into having a different relationship to the images that they're looking at. And so in 10,000 Waves, what we did was to make a work that was very mobile, that was very flexible. It's a nine screen work, but it's also free screen work. It can be a single screen work. It can be shown in the cinema, but it can also be shown um, in a very wide space. So when we installed the work at the Museum of Modern Art, it was a nine screen work that was elevated in the atrium. And one of the things that you could do is that you could go to the top floor and view the work and look down on the installation. And so this idea of mobility and being able to view many positions brings out the sculptural nature of the piece. But also I think in the audience, it's something that is quite exciting to be able to view from different positions um, the way that the actual kind of narrative uh, or montage um, is sort of being developed in, in the work. And, uh, but I can say I was only also, also able to achieve that with the fact that I worked with such amazing sort of um, artists and technicians in China, you know, because I can say that 10,000 Waves, um, apart from an earlier work that I made called Looking for Langston, is really, I would say, the most beautiful work that I've made. And that beauty really comes out of the kind of engagement and commitment that I sort of came across when I was working in um, Shanghai and in mainland China. So extraordinary sort of level of kind of um, sort of commitment aesthetically, artistically, to making sort of the, work, the piece and, uh, you know, that level to detail, you know, might be quite hard to find elsewhere, in fact. So, you know, because that work had to also be a work which was very much a kind of dreamlike work, where the question of mobility and to create the image of someone like Maggie Chong being Mazu and flying, this is all the hallmarks, really, of Chinese cinema, and specifically Hong Kong cinema in particular. So, in a way, all of these things aided the work and were developed from actually the idea of Mazu being able to fly in these different locations and spaces. And so, the whole idea of being able to construct flying screens, double-sided screens that you could view from one sort of, um, from one side to the other, giving it a certain transparency and lightness, all of these aspects emanated from um, the inspiration, really, of looking at the Mazu myth and expanding that in a technological, aesthetic sense. Yeah, I think that's really, so from my point of view, it's extremely interesting because each time when you do a new work, you always try to push the sort of technological boundaries as well, besides the you know, artistic you know, sort of uh, inspiration, the visions, you know. Uh, with 10,000 Ways, I remember you saying that the work itself is 3.7 something K in terms of quality, isn't it? For the, so, so the projection that you're looking at, at the installation, um, just, just to give you a bit of context, I mean, if you go to cinema nowadays, most of them are only 2K in terms of resolution. 
some might be for 4K, but I mean, that doesn't happen that often. Only sort of really big Hollywood production might go up to 4K. So um, why, why, I mean, why are you so interested in pushing that kind of boundaries in terms of doing that? I mean, because it, it gives such an interesting quality, visual quality to the work, especially you actually shot the film on 35 millimeters and then sort of made it into a digital version. Well, I think one of the things I was very initially excited by in terms of moving into the area of making video art or film installation work in this context is really looking at my sort of, um, well, people who are kind of my seniors, people like Bill Viola, um, or sort of people who have been making works for some time. And I was very struck, for example, going to Venice, it's the Howard Zeman Venice, and seeing Sharina Nashat, or seeing Doug Aiken, or seeing, and I remember sort of going to that Venice and seeing so many works which were so exciting. And part of the excitement for me was the way that they were made. You know, that they had, to a certain extent, highly sort of aestheticized production values, and that these weren't sort of being, as it were, compromised. And I think, in a way, one of the enjoyments of being able to make works in this context is being able to research and to work with sort of fellow um, sort of artists and technicians and to explore what are the new possibilities for the image. And so one of the things which has developed through super high definition and through the digital technologies is this possibility for creating a new sensation, a new image, a new experience and to tap into that and to do that then obviously one has to have that sort of interest and um, that interest doesn't just expand into the aesthetic it's also into the sonic area because for example the nine screen work is a 9.2 surround sound so we literally had to invent our own dubbing sort of system we dubbed the piece at peter gabriel's real world studio and um i think i gave my sound designer a heart attack in the process of doing the actual dubbing of the work. But basically we were able to create this sort of, in a way, experience of really trying to also have the sculpt relationship to the sound and to create this sort of new sensation. Because I feel like if you're going to make a work in an art contest and that work needs to be different from the sort of um, context where one would classically show moving image works and to do that, then I think the question of innovation or developing avant-garde techniques is important. So I think with new technologies, there's a possibility for developing sort of new techniques and to create a new experience. And so that's also one of the reasons why I'm very interested in making works. You sort of talked quite a bit about wanting to break away from more traditional sense of moving image and how that's presented to the audience of the public. Uh, but I mean, the, th the thing is, I mean, in recent years, I mean, you, you s we see quite a lot of artists, some visual artists moving into the more traditional kind of cinema context. Um, but you are actually sort of the other way around. You sort of started out from that sort of more narrative or, or um, feature-based kind of uh, moving image practice into what you're known for now, so immersive installation, moving image installations. Um, do you think you would actually go back to making something that's a bit more traditional in terms of the, um, <laughs> the structure of your work? So, you know, um, I'm just kind of curious about that. Well, I think in my latest work, Playtime, it's a work which is quite different to um, 10,000 Waves. It has sort of, um, actors in it like James Franco, non-actors, but people who I think are really amazing performance artists um, and personas like Simon de Puri. And also I was able to encourage Maggie Chong to be in that work. And I also worked with several um, British actors like Colin Salmon. And in that work, it's a more, you could say, kind of traditional narrative to a certain extent where as traditional as I would get, 
and it's, it's, it has a, a certain linearity, and it's a work which, because it's about capital, because it's about life and reflecting on not only the art world but also on sort of working conditions um, for people who, for some reason or other, are sort of um, having to achieve a better life, the theme of better life comes up again, um, to, to get capital so they have to work um, in spaces that they don't necessarily want to work in. In that work it's very much a sort of, in the single screen version, you c it could be shown in the cinema. So I think, that, 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 I think for me, I, I guess what I'm saying is there's always a play between sort of what would be considered more traditional narrative conventions and the, the sort of more avant-garde or experimental sort of, um, sort of techniques. But I think you're right in saying that I am someone that's in a movement that's um, perhaps in not contestation, but it's a different movement from the other movements that are taking place. Because I think it's absolutely fantastic that we have um, someone like Sam Taylor Wood or Sam Taylor Johnson, Fifty Shades of Grey, um, or sort of Steve McQueen doing Twelve Years a Slave. I think all of that is just showing that artists have always been interested in cinema and have always been very important voices. Um, in sort of creating a certain frisson or kind of intervention into um, those kind of more traditional spaces. Um, but that said, I mean, I know, for example, that Steve is making a new work um, for Venice, you know, and uh, so I don't think one has to necessarily choose. I think sort of that one can play between these different modes and I think that's quite exciting. Yeah, I think it's one of those um, discussions that's been so ongoing for quite some time now in terms of how to present moving image works, especially, especially in a museum or gallery context. Uh, I remember sort of reading an article about Derek Jartman a few years ago and in a film magazine, actually, and they were saying that, oh, perhaps if he were still alive today, like his work could have been shown in a more gallery-like space and that could have actually reached to a wider sort of audience. I mean, would you agree with that statement in a sense? Because I, I know you sort of, um, you know, you made a film about his life work in a sense and that, you know, um, he's been sort of quite an important figure in your practice as well. I mean, would you like to elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think sort of, um the film that I made with Tilda Swinton, which was on Derek Jarman, Tilda Swinton was introduced to cinema in Derek Jarman's films. And I think we felt that he was sort of being forgotten. So we tried to make this work um, documentary that reintroduced him, his work to a new audience. But also, I had an ulterior motive in making this work, which is that Derek Jarman had made these wonderful Super 8 films, um, all 73 of them, and I thought it would be very interesting to get those works a certain exposure. And one of the things that I did when I created the exhibition at the Seven Time Gallery um, was to basically foreground these Super 8 films. And one of the really amazing, exciting things that developed from that was um, the Luma Foundation, Maya Hoffman, acquiring those um, 73 films and doing a conservation work on those films um, over like 1.7 million um, conservation. And basically, now those works exist in the Luma collection. And so that there was a sort of ulterior motive to making that exhibition to foreground these um, Super 8 films that Derek had made. And so I think, you're right, I think, you know, um, maybe someone like Derek, if he had lived, would have had um, the possibility to enjoy sort of um, a kind of renaissance and appreciation of his works in a sort of gallery context. Although I think Derek was a very contrary figure and perhaps would have, might have run straight to Hollywood as well. <laughs> so, um, but I think one of the things 
um, obviously his film Blue, which is um, being shown at the Museum of Modern Art um, for the, over the last six months, and also at Tate Modern, um, are all part of the sort of resurgent interest in his work. And uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that I I was a catalyst in that resurgent interest because I think there was something that was very important about the sort of um, aesthetic experiments that he was doing. Um, something that I think that the art world has responded to um, in quite a fantastic manner. Um, you, you spoke a bit about conservation as well. As in, um, I, I'm curious because I, I, quite a lot of filmmakers or artists I've spoken to about this, they, I think they sort of they resigned to the fact that you know, film is going to die out at some point. It's gonna, all going to be digital. Uh, do, do you agree with that and, uh, and how do you feel about that? I mean, because I know you still sort of work with film most of the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say that one of the things that's really interesting about making the 10,000 Ways work is that it was made just on the cusp, 2010 is the time where basically people are still involved in making films or shooting works on film. So that means that there's still several film laboratories which are in operation and sort of processing film, etc. But now that's dwindled, you know, so that's almost impossible. And my last two works are actually shot on digital. I have to say that Playtime, the work that I shot recently, which is shot in super high definition, it's filmed on a red epic camera. It probably means nothing to anybody, but to us, it means quite a lot in the sense that it has this kind of super resolution effect. And so I think in a way what I've tried to do is to embrace this term to a certain extent where what can we develop in this moment? Um, and so at the moment, I think I'm still in this sort of indices of developing that aesthetic and what these images can look like. And I think it's quite exciting. But I'm still, <laughs> now that I have delved into the digital kind of arena in terms of making images, I, I think I have a good idea of what's being lost in relationship to the analog material. And so um, in my work, my newest work that I'm going to be making, I'm going to be making the work both in digital and on film for the different sections. Yeah, so I think, but I think artists like Tasta Dean who have led the way in trying to make sure that film doesn't disappear, I'm completely for, so, because um, I do think there's something that's essentially important about film as film. Yeah, but uh, well, that's actually really interesting because I think a lot of time artists are actually sort of uh, fighting for that and, you know, so holding on to the tradition of film as a medium or the analog sort of materials, whereas I think a lot of some slightly more commercial filmmakers are sort of really kind of just like, oh yeah, let's just go with digital, it's just easier in terms of distribution, in terms of quite a lot of other sort of uh, practical sort of issues as well. Um, I, mean, I think all filmmakers or people who make moving images are saddened by the idea that they can't shoot their works on film. You know, but it's, it's a kind of economic imperative and the fact that at certain moments industries just change and they become, you know, they, they, because computerization, digitalization has changed everything. Um, just, I think for me, just one last question really. Um, do you think that will have a huge impact in terms of how your work is going to look like? Or, or is that sort of part of your thinking already, really? Well, I think it will, but I think for me it would be how much can you carry of the sort of feeling of the sort of analog and of, let's call it the kind of modernist aesthetic imperatives in a work versus the brave new world. You know, and I think there are some artists like Ed Aikens, who's very much dwelling into this brave new world of the image um, and what that looks like. Um, and I think that's very interesting. But I guess I'm a modernist, so I think I'm going to keep onto that side for the time being. All right. Uh, 
I think we should have some questions time from the audience. Am I correct here? Um, yes, I think there's a question. Yeah. Oh, I think someone's giving you a mic. Here's the mic. Yeah. Your work in the Sydney Biennale on Cockatoo Island was easily the standout work of the show, and you say that it's gone on since then in many other iterations. Has it developed and changed? Well, I think one of the things around um, the pre presentation of 10,000 Waves um, during the Sydney Biennial um, in 2010 was that we presented it in this configuration or scenography and this question of trying to choreograph the spectator, it was an experiment. Will it work this time? It failed miserably when I did it at the Pompidou. And so when we showed the piece, we were really excited by the way that people interacted with it. It and worked we, brilliantly. And I think it worked that time. And so when we've shown the work, one of the things that we've tried to do is to you know, for example, when I was um, approached um, to show the work here, you know, we usually say yes to any installation space, more or less, you know, because we like the idea of the work being very flexible and being able to be shown in as many kind of configurations. But we always try to work with the architecture of the space. So when we've shown it, um, for example, in um, Finland, the work was shown across three rooms. And I could say that maybe that was perhaps slightly stretching that piece. But nonetheless, it was a very interesting encounter for the audience. And similarly, when we showed the work in the Museum of Modern Art, and it was, as it were, sort of suspended in mid-air, that was also very challenging. And um, it was shown in a white space but I think we basically, in all our sort of installations of the work, we have seen it as a sort of interesting and exciting way of trying to show that work. And, you know, in a way, through technology, through um, the expertise of the, the people that I work with, we have been able to kind of show it in these different manifestations. When the work was shown, um, in Shang Art, it was shown in the black space, and when it was shown um, in the Hayward Gallery, it was in the blue space. So we've tried to experiment with how you would exhibit the work, and um, so one of the things which we do is we do sort of, in a way, examine how people react to the work, and take that knowledge and then try to re. Um, install it the next time in this in a, in a slightly different manner. Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, hello, I'm Simon Kirby from Victoria Miro Gallery. Um, I've obviously followed 10,000 Ways since the very beginning, so it's fantastic to see it here in Hong Kong now. Um, well, Simon, before he worked at Victoria Miro Gallery when he lived in Shanghai, brought me to several locations um, for 10,000 Waves and, uh, you know, several locations that you see in that work is because of him. So thank you, Simon. Okay. <laughs> I just um, wanted to. <laughs> um, uh, I think you spoke so interestingly about casting the piece. So in a way, my question is a metaphysical one. So I want to know about the magic of cinema. Um, through casting those particular actresses, um, does Mazu really come alive? Well, I, I think that sort of, in a way, I think the spirit of Mazu is certainly alive, and I think in um, the incarnation with Maggie Chong as Mazu, there's a way in which I think that I could only say that the reception to that work is connected to Mazu's spirit, and I think it's been a guiding principle in that work. And I think there's a way in which that 
certainly um, the connection to that perspective to see the tragedy not from a Western point of view, um, but to see it from Mazu's point of view. The poem that Wang Ping wrote when we were working with Maggie um, when we were filming in the Guangxi province, all of that work, I think, developed in a particular manner. And I think it was something which was, you know, something which develops out of the process, you know, because we researched that project for quite a long time. And so I think that Mazu does resonate, and she certainly is a deity which is worshipped um, in this whole region. So I think I've, I've been very much under Mazu's guidance in making the work. Um, there's a question over there, I think. Um, so I am a student from uh, a high school in China. So um, I'm really interested in the art career. So are there any advice that you could give us as a art, as a young artist? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I think I was a young artist quite some time ago. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that, but I just kind of didn't feel like I could. <laughs> no, but I think sort of, you know, the thing is, is that, I mean, when I started making works, I write about this in a book which I sort of co-wrote um, with Cynthia Rose, which is slightly autobiographical, um, called Riot. And in the beginning opening chapters, I write about... Um, how I became involved in making art, making films, and making photography. And I think, for me, really, it's about the question of curiosity, you know, like how curious one is, and then the idea of trying to sustain one's vision, you know, and how you can go about that in relationship to sustain a vision. Um, and to bring those two things. So I would say it's probably, you know, 80% hard work and 20% good luck <laughs> in relationship to kind of being an artist, you know. So I think that, I also think there are certain moments, certain zeitgeists, you know, that one can see and it's also the choice of how you can enter into those and you know but I think it's the commitment to your vision you know and that commitment to your vision how that uh, resonates around to other people um, I think that's the thing that is important to commit to as a young artist can I ask a following question? Sorry. Um, sorry, I think because we can only take one more question, probably, right? Sorry. Yeah, so maybe we need to give that to someone else. Uh, uh, anyone else for question? One last question. I think we've got time for that. Oh, here. I see a hand here. <laughs> uh, yes, I just was wondering if the poem that you talked about played a role in the in the installation work and if you could say anything more about the role that writing plays in your work yes I mean I think the, the, the role of poetry has been um, a fact has been a theme in many works early works that I made in um, the sort of late 80s of films like looking for Langston which was ostensibly a film about Langston Hughes and uh, questions of homoeroticism um, was very much inspired by Essex Hemphill's poems and Langston Hughes's poems. And so I think the, the question of poetry is very important because I think I see my works as visual poems to a certain extent. And so poetry in a way lends itself to a certain visualization. I would say that in um, a work like 10,000 Waves that what I wanted to do was not to illustrate the poems necessarily, but to make the poems act as a vehicle for sort of 
a point of identification. And uh, so I think the collaboration with Wang Ping um, was very important. But I think it was also the idea to commission her to write and to also create the space for that so you wouldn't have something that had to be written within a week. You know, it took her a year to write the first poem and then the inspiration for writing Mazu took place when we were filming and she came to film with us and so, you know, that did have to be a bit quicker. <laughs> so I think, um, but, but I think it's really that aspect of really how poetry can sort of resonate in a particular manner. But I mean, poetry wouldn't be appropriate for everything. So a work about capital, <laughs> like playtime, I mean, poetry would not really make sense. So it's also connected to the subject. Um, so I think in this sense, it, it lends itself to the lyrical dimension of the work. And in a work like Look at Langston or 10,000 Waves, the question of lyricism is important. So, um, and work like Playtime, lyricism isn't so important. You know, it's content, facts, and information. All right, great. I think, thank you very much for Isaac for being here with us. And I think, um, yeah, our time is up, so I think we need to leave the stage, really. Uh, but thank you again. And uh, 10,000 Ways being shown at Cal Depot Artist Village until the 26th of April. And we are also showing the single screen version at the cinema, uh, Broadway Cinematique at Yamate on the 20th, which is this Friday. And we will actually have another conversation after screening that night. So please join us if you can. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.